In this lesson, we'll continue to look at stoichiometry, the mass-to-mass -mass type of stoichiometry. We're going to go another step now and learn how to calculate percent yield. So this is the homework you were assigned. You were assigned to find the limiting reactant given these uh, chemicals here in the reaction. So now the first thing you need to know is how did I get FeCl2? Well, this goes back a couple of units, where iron 2 chloride is FeCl2, and here's how you know. Iron 2, the Roman numeral 2, means that you have an iron with a 2 plus charge. It doesn't mean you have two irons. Iron 2 is the name of the ion that has a 2 plus charge. Okay, when we learned to name these things, we said that um, many of the metals have more than one oxidation number, and when they do, when you have a compound with that metal, you've got to write the name with the correct um, charge number with the, that's part of the name. The Roman numeral 2 tells you this iron has a 2 plus charge. Chloride uh, is in column 7A of the periodic table, and almost all of those are going to be a 1 negative charge. But you could also look on the list that I gave you of common ions, or not common ions, it's a periodic table with oxidation numbers, and see that chloride has a bunch of oxidation numbers, but since iron is a plus charge, the chlorine's got to be negative, otherwise you'll never get a negative, uh, a neutral charged compound. So the only one of these chlorine um, oxidation numbers is going to work is this one negative down here at the very last one. So that's a one negative, and so the way you get that to balance out charge-wise is to have FeCl2. Hydrosulfuric acid. The hydro prefix means you have a binary acid. So there's only two elements, hydrosulfuric. The sulfuric means we had a sulfide ion, okay? I becomes ic. It's also true that eight becomes ic, but when you have a polyatomic ion with an AT ending, you don't have a hydro prefix. The hydro prefix tells you you have a binary acid, which means you have a monoatomic cation, single atom cation. And sulfur in a binary compound is going to have a two negative charge. Okay? Now, hydrogen, if it's an acid, has to have a one plus charge. No other possibility. So the only one of the charges on sulfur that will work is the two negative in order to have a neutral compound. So we're going to need two hydrogens, and we're going to get H2S. That's how we got that formula. So to find a limiting reactant, we're going to have to have a balanced equation. Okay, and then we're going to do two different mass-to-mass -mass calculations. There's a lot of different ways to find uh, a limiting reactant, but the way that I taught you to do it is to use a mass-to-mass -mass calculation. So let's first balance the equation. We're reacting iron 2 chloride and uh, hydrosulfuric acid, so FeCl2 and H2S. Um, it says they're reacted in a beaker, but it doesn't say say that they are dissolved. So what we first need to do is to figure out, will these dissolve? Well, we go over here to the solubility rules and look at chlorides. It says that chlorides are mostly soluble. There are some exceptions, but iron is not an exception. So this must be an aqueous compound here. Okay? And then sulfides. Sulfides are listed down here in the insoluble section. It says that sulfides are insoluble except when they're bonded with a group 1. Well, guess where hydrogen is located? Group 1. Therefore, this is aqueous. All right. Now, we have two two-part compounds, and so you could say this is the A part and B part and C part and D part. So the A part is going to go with the D part over here. So we'll get Fe and S. And the C part is going to go with the B part. C is coming first because it's the positive part. Hydrogen is a positive ion up here. So we're going to get H with Cl. Okay. And this is a chloride. So chlorides are mostly soluble. No exceptions for a hydrogen chloride. That's hydrochloric acid, which I hope you guys know is uh, can dissolve. So it's going to be aqueous. Okay. And then sulfides, 
we've got a sulfide here that's mostly insoluble. Those are mostly insoluble. The exceptions are group 1 and 2, and ammonium. Iron is not in group 1 or group 2, and it's certainly not ammonium. Iron is well over here in the transition metals. So this must be a solid. All right, we need to balance the formulas now. Iron has a 2 plus charge here. We, we, iron can have more than one charge. But since we started with a 2 plus and there's no indication that it changes, we have to assume this is a 2 plus here. Sulfur has a 2 negative, so that, that's balanced. The 2 plus and a 2 negative, they cancel each other out. Hydrogen is 1 plus. Chloride is 1 negative. That cancels out. So those are that formula is balanced. Now, once the formulas are balanced, leave them alone. You don't change anything in the formula. You can only put coefficients in front to balance the equation. So we're going to write out all the elements that we have here in this. Fe, Cl, H, and S. And make a kind of spreadsheet grid, sort of, in order to count up everything and see if, how, we're, how well we're balancing out the uh, equation. So we've got one iron over here and two chlorines and two hydrogens and one sulfur. Over, over, this, over on this side, we've got one iron, got one chlorine, we've got one hydrogen, and one sulfur. So what we need to do is to get two hydrogens and two chlorines over on this side of the equation to get everything balanced out. So I'll put a coefficient 2 here. That'll change both the hydrogen and the chlorine to 2. The 2 coefficient multiplies everything inside. So that means we're balanced now. So the equation's balanced. Now, we've got to do a mass-to-mass -mass calculation from um, one, of, one of the two reactants. This is, both of these on the left side will be reactants. And then find a product we're going to go to. It really doesn't matter which product. In this problem, I don't say we're going to find a certain product. It doesn't matter which one. Because doing it either way, going to this product or going to this product, I'll find the limiting reactant for you. Okay? I like to go to this one, but that's not required. Okay? Rick, you want me to do it both ways? Or does it matter? Nobody cares. Well, I'm going to go to the iron. Unless somebody wants me to do one to hydrochloric acid, I won't do it then. So, we start with 90 grams of FeCl2. Put it over one. In order to go from one chemical species to another, I've got to have moles. I've got to get, go through moles to do that. This is a molar ratio we need here. So I first have to change the grams of FeCl2 into moles. And for that, we need to calculate the molar mass. So we're going to write down the elements we have here and write down their um, atomic mass. And iron is 55.845. And chlorine's atomic mass is 35.453. We have one iron and two chlorines. So this is 55.845. And this is going to be 35.845. 453 times 2. So that's 70.906. And we'll add all of that up. We get 126.751. All right, 120, did I say 126? 120, I, said, I wrote down 127, but it's 126, isn't it? 126.751, not 127.751. All right. Now, this is the grams of FeCl, or FeCl2, in one mole. So I have to write out this equality statement. And you have to have the equality statement because that's going to be needed to, to build this conversion unit I'm going to put right here. So I want to find the units and species I have here in this equality statement and put that side of the equality statement on the bottom. So the, the first part here, 126.751 grams of FeCl, FeCl2. That, those units and species match these. So this side, the left side or the top side here of the equality statement goes in the bottom.
and the other side of the equality statement is going to go on the top. When we cancel out what we can cancel out to simplify, now we've got moles. Well, since we're at moles now, now I can convert to another species. You can't convert from one species to another unless your material is measured in moles. And I have in the balanced equation one FeCl2 and one FeS. And that's a one-to-one -one ratio. So I can assume those to be moles. Okay? So I can build a conversion factor, a molar ratio, to go from FeCl2 by saying this is one mole of FeCl2. and one mole of FES. Okay, that allows me to get to a point where I'm simplifying here, get rid of the uh, units of measurement moles and the species FECL. I'm now at FES. To get the mass of FES, I need to convert this into grams, and so for that I need another molar mass. So iron has an atomic mass of 55.845. Um, sulfur has an atomic mass of 32.065. Both of these are times 1. Now, when you put this in your calculator, let's do that right here and just see what that looks like so we can, I, I can show you something real quick that's important. If we take 55.845 and add that to 32.065, it looks like we have 87.91, okay? But if you add these up vertically, it's 87.910, okay? So if you just put down 87.91, that's not the correct number of significant digits. There's no empty slots to the right over here. There's nothing to round off. So this is the correct number of significant digits. You have to be smarter than your calculator. Your calculator very often will give you the correct number of significant digits. You have to know what they should be. This then is grams of FES, and that's equal to one mole of FES. Now, I've got moles of FES on the top here. So this time I need this side of the equality statement to go on the bottom because I want to match the units and species I have here with what I put on the bottom. So I put one mole of FES on the bottom and I put the grams on the top, 87.910 grams of FES. And we're ready to do the math. Well, let's simplify here first. Moles and FES go away. Now I have grams of FES. We're ready to do the math. So we're going to take this number and multiply it by this number. I'm skipping over the ones because multiplying by one just gives you the same answer. So this number times this number, it equals, and then divide by this number. That's the fast way to get this done. There are a lot of ways to do it correct in the calculator, a lot of ways to do it wrong in the calculator. What we're doing here is just trying to find the fastest way because that makes our life easier. So we've got 90.0 times 87.910. Hit enter, and then hit the divide button on your calculator and put in 126.751 and I get this number here 62.4208 all right 62.4208 that's grams of FES and I need to look at the numbers that we have here in this problem and figure out the significant digits we need well of the measured and calculated numbers that's what we're looking at this is a measured number here this is a calculated number, that's a calculated number, and all the other numbers in here are um, counted numbers. We don't use counted numbers for figuring out significant digits, only the measured and calculated numbers. So all the measured and calculated numbers, this first one has the least digits. We want our final answer to have the same number of digits as the number in the problem of the measured and calculated numbers with the least digits. So that's three digits we want in the final answer. We're going to underline everything after the first three digits. Draw an arrow to show that we're rounding off. Arrows are the only appro approved way of showing you're rounding off. And write 62.4 grams of FES. Okay, now that's just the first of the two mass to mass problems we have to do. Okay, now we're ready to go to the second. The second one then is going to take the other reactant, 
we, we, we started with this one the first time, FECL with a subscript 2. Now we're going to start with this and go to the same product. Okay? We're going to just do a mass to mass calculation going to the same product. So let's see, we have 52.0 grams of H2S. And I'll be careful. I have a lot of students, I say a lot, occasionally students will take this same number and put it in there and the problem. Well, this the, the amount of H2S, the hydrosulfuric acid, is 52.0 grams. Make sure you're using the right amounts, okay, to start with. To get from the ma mass of H2S to moles of H2S, we need molar mass. So we're going to put in hydrogen and sulfur, put in their atomic masses. Hydrogen's atomic mass is 1.00794. I have two of them in the formula, and sulfur is 32.065. That's just one of those. Okay, so uh, let's see. 1.00794 times 2 is this number, and then we're going to add to that 32.065. Actually, you know what? This calculator doesn't only is only showing four digits past the decimal. And I'm looking at my problem here, and I'm seeing that I really should have two eights here. So what it did was to round off to this, this place here. This should be two eights on the end. Okay? It doesn't really matter in the long run because you're going to round it off anyway, but you should your your calculators are probably going to have more digits. This is a simulator on the computer and it's got fewer digits just because it wants to simplify things uh, for you guys to see what's going on. But anyway, we have two empty slots here. We would have rounded off the 9 anyway, either way. So those digits are going to go away when we round it off. So in the pr previous two occasions when we were calculating molar mass, we didn't have any empty slots to the right, so there was no reason to round off. Okay, so when you're adding or subtracting, you round off any digits resulting from empty slots to the right. Multiplication and division is a different um, uh, rule, set of rules for finding out significant digits. But in this case, we're going to round off that 88, and we're going to get 34.081 grams of H2S equals one mole of H2S. Now, for me, you always have to have this equality statement. If you calculate molar mass, and you get just this number right here, well, that's one, two, three, four, five, six points you lose. If you write down the number with the, the units and species here, you still lose the four points over here. So make sure you write out the equality statement, okay? It's kind of important. It's important for you to have it there to help you to build the correct uh, conversion unit. Right, I'm trying to emphasize what a conversion unit is co comes from. It comes from two things that are equal, all right? All right, so we want to match units and species here in the top with the side of the equality statement where those same units and species are found. So that's this side. We're going to put that side 34.081 grams of H2S on the bottom and the one mole of H2S on the top. Now just in case somebody's watching this video and thinking, well, he's propagating an error. You're right. But I'm having students in the high school level to practice rounding over and over again uh, just to make sure they get down, get the rounding down, okay? It's just something for some reason high school students struggle with is just how to round. It shouldn't be that hard, but it seems to be. So let's cancel out what we can cancel out. And we're ready now to convert uh, from moles of H2S to the species we're looking for, the chemical species at the end we're looking for, the product. So there's one mole of H2S and one mole of FES. Okay? So I'll put the one, one mole of H2S on the bottom and the one mole of FES on the top. So we kind of got lucky here in this problem in that there's a one-to-one -one ratio from FECL2 to FES and a one to one ratio from, H, ratio from H2S to FES as well. If I were using some other chemical, like this coefficient 2 here, 
those numbers would change. Okay, so these numbers come from the balanced equation, but we're not finding HCl in this case, we're finding HFES. It just kind of simplifies things for us, um, but you have to make sure you're using the correct coefficient when you're building your molar ratio. All right, we can cancel out moles in H2S, and now we need to convert from moles of FES to grams of FES. Well, we've already calculated the molar mass down here, so we don't need to calculate it a second time. If it's done once, that's good enough. So we're going to take the moles that I have on the bottom here, or in, in the right-hand side of this equation here, and put it on the bottom here because I want to cancel moles that are on the top here. So one mole of FES, those units and species now match. Okay, and the other side of the equality statement goes on the top, 87.910 grams of FES. Simplify by canceling, and we're ready to do the math. Remember, we're going to multiply everything across the top, hit enter, and then divide separately anything on the bottom. Well, we've only got one number here that's other than one, so we only have to divide once in this case. All right, so we've got uh, 52.0 times 87.910, and hit enter. Then we're going to divide by 34.081, and I get this number here. Did I do that right? Let's see, 52 times 87.910 divided by 34, okay. All right, so we, the units we have left are grams. The species we have left is FES. And we need to round this off now. We've got three digits here, and these other two uh, calculated numbers have five digits. We want to round it off to three digits to match the number, measure the calculated number of the least digits. And we get 134 grams of FES. Now, we have two different masses of FES here, okay? Of these two numbers that we calculated for FES, this is the smaller number, okay? This being the smaller number tells us that the species we started with in this calculation is the limiting reactant. So FeCl2 is the limiting reactant. Iron 2 chloride is the limiting reactant. So therefore, Iron 2 chloride is the limiting reactant. All right? Yes. Yeah. So if you calculate the uh, mass of product in this way, you not only find that this is the limiting reactant, one of the two reactors. We've got a, two reactors on the left, two products on the right. Not every equation has two of both, but this, most of these do. Um, this is the limiting reactant, and this is the theoretical yield. Okay? So once you, get the, once you do this math two ways and figure out which one of these two gives you the least amount of product, that will, help you, that will tell you that your um, chemical species you started with in the equation is your limiting reactant, and the amount of the product you calculate is the theoretical yield. So, sixty-two point four grams of FES is the theoretical yield. Okay. The theoretical yield. What are the three dots for? I mean, that three dots mean therefore. Is there what? Therefore. Oh, therefore. Mm-hmm. Okay. I think they're like therefore. No. <laughs> yeah. I thought I was playing with your mind there. So there, there are four. No, that means the word there, T H E R E F O R E, okay. therefore. Okay. Oh, I got that. Got it. Okay. Now, the theoretical yield is very important. So let me kind of explain what the theoretical yield is, okay? If it were possible to get 
absolutely every molecule or atom of product out when you're done at the end of a lab or at, at some process. That'd be the theoretical yield. So we just did a lab two days ago, two day, last week, and we finished it up yesterday, where you were um, <coughs> capturing or filtering out some product at the end, right? Did you get every single molecule or formula unit or crystal of that stuff out? Everybody had a little bit of the material left in the solution when you filtered, didn't you? Yes. Okay, there was even some yellow material that was left on the sides of your beaker and such, weren't there? Not ours. Not yours? No, you perfectly cleaned out that. Yeah, we used the water. Even if you think that you got it all out, you don't. There's still some left over. Just, just because it's just not possible. All right? There's always some left somewhere. In the, in the filtering apparatus, in the beaker, on the... Um, any of the material, any of the instruments you use to manipulate the chemicals, you get it on the forceps, there's always some that's lost, okay? So you never have the perfect amount, okay? This is like perfect, and you can't get perfect. Perfect doesn't happen. You, you with me? All right? Wait, because perfect does not happen. Perfect does not happen, okay? And how do scientists know that they've created, like, cures and Well, even if you've got a cure for some disease, there's always somebody who doesn't respond to that cure. There's no perfect cure for every, every single disease. So then what do you do for that one person? Treat them, treat them for the illness. Or if they, yeah, they could die, yeah, sure. It happens. We keep looking for better and better results, but there's no, there's no perfection here, okay? All right? Now, however... This number is important because it helps us to figure out how efficient our process is. This number is important because it helps us to figure out how efficient our process is. Okay? And the way you do that is what's called percent yield. Okay? Now, percent yield is the percent of product you actually got at the end divided by the theoretical yield and then times 100. All percents are part over whole times 100, right? So let's just remember that percents are part over whole times 100. That's what it always is, okay? And so a percent yield is going to follow this pattern. A percent yield is the uh, actual yield, the amount you actually collected, the amount you actually have at the end of the process over this theoretical yield, the, the perfect amount that you can't get to. Okay, so... And of course, to get a percent, you're always multiplying by 100. Okay? All right, then, let's take a look at the problem we're looking at here, the original problem. Okay, so here's the problem we're working on. Suppose now we add this to it, and we say that not only have we gathered, uh, have we found out what the limiting reactant is, but we want to find out what the percent yield is if we could collect 47.3 grams. We're adding this to the problem. This is your homework problem. We're adding to it now. Okay. No, the actual yield is going to be the 47.3. Okay, and the theoretical yield is going to be the 62.4. The theoretical yield is 62.4. So we're going to divide those or whatever. Divide those and multiply by 100. Divide what? Oh. It's not hard, really. Come on. <laughs> Pay attention. Here we go. Actual yield by theoretical yield times 100. How much was actually collected as described in the problem? No, 62.4 was not actually collected. Look at the problem I have here on the board. How much was actually collected? How much was actually, how much of the product was actually collected? Okay, that's your actual yield. Perform the calculation for the, to find a percent yield, please. All right, then let's take a look. 
at, we're at how to calculate the percent yield, make sure everybody's on, on board here. So I put the actual yield, and the problem it says you collected 47.3 grams. That's the actual yield. We divide it by the theoretical yield that we calculated. Now, I can cancel out units and species. Make sure you do that. Now, here's the thing. The reason I want you to do this is this. Anytime you calculate a percent correctly, the units will always cancel. Anytime you calculate a percent correctly, the units will always cancel. The species in some percents won't cancel, but in this case, the species also cancels. But the units will always cancel if a percent is set up properly. What is the unit? Deja. Um, do you have to write the unit in the first? Yes. Okay, because I didn't. Is it Moria? Is that a two or seven? Here? That's a seven. That's a seven right there. At the bottom, that's a seven. That's a two there. All right, now let's keep going. So let's do the math here. So we got 47.3 divided by 62.4, enter, and times 100. Okay, and you got 75.8013 on this calculator anyway. It's probably more digits on most of your calculators. It was less? Okay, well you probably need to check that you're set up your calculator because you need to have more digits than that. Alright, so this is a percent. Okay. And we need to round this off. Over here, this is a counting number. All right, you don't use this 100 to figure out significant digits. These two are measured numbers. Actually, this is a calculated number. That's a measured number. And those have three digits. We want our final answer to have three digits. So after the first three digits, we un underline everything else, draw an arrow to show we're rounding off, and write our answer as 75.8%. Now, just writing 75.8% is not clear enough. Percent yield. Percent yield. Of what? Of FES. Uh huh. Uh, you can say of or in FES. So why do we have to write the yield? Because that's what the percent applies to. Okay. I want you I want you to be very clear about what you're giving a percent for. Okay. All right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, before we do that, let me talk about your lab. Okay. In your lab, you had a post lab to do. Okay, and one of the things that you were asked to do uh, was to put your balanced equation in this slot right here that you should have already done. Yeah. Now you have everything you need to do this other part that you go to this link for here. Okay, so you click on that link and it's going to take you to a form. And what you're going to do is you're going to calculate the percent yield for your lab and put in all your information in this form. Well, you calculate it. Well, we just did it. And you're going to say, what the question is, what mass of lead to nitrate did your lab group start with in running this chemical reaction? It should have been between about 0.2 and 0.3 grams. Okay? You should have had something in that range. What mass of potassium iodide did you start with? You put that in there. Based on your calculation, what is your limiting reactant? Now, here's the thing. No, no two groups might have the same limiting reactant. I set this lab up on purpose so that depending on the amount of reactants you start with, different groups will have different limiting reactants. Some of you will have lead to nitrate, some of you will have potassium iodide. So your math has to justify your answer. Okay? Alright, uh, then based on your, let's see, what's the identity of your precipitate? Well, the precipitate is the solid that was formed. So if you wrote a balanced equation, one of the two products you should have written as a solid. That's the precipitate. That's what goes right there. From the measurements you wrote in your lab logbook, what is the mass of precipitate that your lab group collected at the end of the lab? Now, to find this mass, you should have, probably would have, uh, put the uh, watch glass with the filter paper with the product you collected all on the balance. And then you have to subtract the weight of the watch glass and subtract the weight of the filter paper to get to the mass of your precipitate. Okay? 
So don't put the mass of the filter paper and precipitate and watch glass in here. This should be just the weight of the precipitate. Okay, so you have to subtract. If you did it the way you were instructed to do it, you have a weight at the end. What you weighed yesterday would have been the weight of the precipitate, filter paper, and watch glass. And you have to subtract the filter paper and watch glass to get just the weight of the precipitate. And that's what goes right there. Yeah, this is a, well, this is a Google form, yes. Okay, it's not in your, this is not in your folder, but there's a link in your post lab document to take you to this. Okay, all right. Now then, now that I've shown you how, we have all the skills we need to calculate the percent yield for your lab. And everybody's going to have a different percent yield. Now your actual yield is the amount you got in this plot right here. Okay, you're going to have to calculate for the theoretical yield and then calculate the percent yield. You can put in your name and your class period. And then hit submit. Make sure you hit submit. If you don't hit submit, I don't get the answer and you get a zero. So make sure you hit submit.